Yeah, book club Wednesday episode. Was it? It's yeah, Wednesday episode, which is a book club with people you know, in the uprising. Um, and then we also have upcoming on Friday at 6, our second uh, rapid fire faculty. Um, so that's it. Um, it's nice to see being the sort of guest. I guess I'm both the guest host tonight, but I'm also going to hand it off to another guest host who will be Jimenez, who will introduce us. So it is really with extreme enthusiasm and pleasure to introduce Peter Jan Hinkles uh, from Speedism. Uh, he's one of the two partners uh, that uh, began this operation uh, between Stuttgart and, Br and Brussels. And I guess UIC at this point has collected uh, all three cards of what I see as being what uh, the landscape of Brussels is like. There's somewhere between office and 51 North, uh, North Bay East, uh, that would be the Prince. Uh, there's JDS, which would be somewhere between some, something like the uh, uh, leopard-ridden uh, outcast of an ex-crusader that returns home that nobody wants to talk to, that would be Julian Dishman. And, and we have uh, uh, Pirion Hinkles, the court jester, uh, my favorite. <laughs> uh, there's, no, we, there, I mean, I, I guess we don't really, I really want to spend, I just want to say that I think um, perhaps our shared, uh, you know, uh, attitude uh, towards representation uh, when it comes to the uh, re uh, maybe the reaction towards uh, hyper-realistic representation and the deliberate misuse of uh, the lineman and pro uh, projection plane is somewhere we began to talk and uh, and under the you know uh, let's say Bob's uh, fifth point of perverse precision uh, we can see uh, uh, some of Peter Young's work uh, in all of this. Peter Young is a very celebrated artist, actually, as, as well as uh, an architect with speedism. He teaches at uh, St. Luca, which dropped a sink. Okay. All right. With no further ado, here's Peter Young in close. Um, 
what characterizes my work, um, apart from looking for um, stretching the boundaries, is the fact that I make these families of words. Um, cooperation is very important. Um, I, I, I tend to attract as well idols as friends and family as the general audience into projects. Um, the stability of the work is also, also in, always in question. Um, the status of the work might in one project be uh, the main character, the leading role, in the other one it might reappear as an extra. Um, so I could say that I see my works as network objects or installations that require forms of exchange to exist, but that also require an, a certain experience to, um, yeah, or, or yeah, to, yeah, to feel them, to see them, to get to them. So I'll sprint to some projects. Very good. Um, this is a record cover from a record that I made with Christian Vogel. He's a, a techno guru um, and grand people graphic designers from Norway. Um, where, from my own position as a, as a young artist, I could just you know call them and ask me to work on a project. I could never approach them as a fan, but I did in a kind of professional fan way. Um, so we made a record together called One Beat. Uh, one Beat features one loop groove and one one loop, and I. Uh, for me, this is kind of sculptural work, you know, just making just one locking groove in a record. Um, and also, to me, this, this record is the beginning of an art project that has a dynamic that is maybe more uh, linked to the music scene, uh, where you feel your audience and, and you, you, um, you are in the middle of things and you can remix and you can invite and recollect and remix all the time. Um, so, with the record, I made installations that I call Thousand Beats in which families of uh, sound equipment um, borrowed from the audience through an open call of the museum are brought together and they shape the installation. And they all play the same record loop over and over again. This was an opening of an exhibition. You know, I finally get to see my audience in a sense. I can play them. Um, it could also happen, it could happen like in six weeks. It could also be half an hour, just a very, very small performance. Uh, we did that a couple of times. Um, out of the whole idea of having this loop um, as a generator of, of images and collaborations came a slightly bigger loop or turntable uh, where I built this velodrome, a museum-sized velodrome um, that of course also brought with it all these questions of who's going to ride it, how we're going to ride it, um, how to connect it to the rest of the museum so we got a hole to the bar so we could rise up in the center like the gladiators. Um, the team were no cyclists, but my tallest friends, so they would make the nicest contrast on a small track. Um, we made drawn blood drawings for the for the wheels. Uh, the helmets were beset with little mirror bits to refer back to that turntable, um, and all kinds of bifurcations came on. So I did a show in Amsterdam in the gallery, which I, I, I designed, so to say, as a test site, as a kind of international stage. So I took my uh, my gang. Um, I built a wind tunnel. Um, we did test drives of the bikes, uh, of the gear, as <laughs> you can see. And all along came all these little performances and events and works in the, in the form of something very temporary. Uh, out of which maybe the most specific was a World Quarter Hour record attempt, where we did 15 minutes, as many laps as possible, me and, and the other fake named hero bicycles on the, by bikers on the board there. Um, I also did organized with the museum a race for the audience in the area of the museum. Um, yeah, um, so the cycling track moves on, moves to a bigger space, um, goes to the Center for Fine Arts in Brussels, which is a building by Victor Horta, the Art Nouveau architect, um, which is really pretty, but the acoustics are very sharp and loud and noisy, which means that I can finally use my, my track again as a musical instrument, as a medium to activates, so to say, the, the sonic qualities of the space. So we did a performance at night where we recorded the sounds of the track and we made a new record. And the record has again a loop. And the loop is one, one cyclist riding my track, but with, let's say, the heavy road feel of, of the music. And out of that came new installations with turntables playing the loop, etc. etc. The helmets, uh, they also uh, reappeared as the, as the lead role in a in human disco bomb. Uh, which is 120 of those helmets that were made in a small town. Um, to inaugurate the sculpture, we did a race with people wearing the helmets at night, spotlights on the rooftops. And every time I present the work, 
you can light it differently, you can hang it somewhere else. Um, you have a totally different sense of the space where you use it. Um, gadgets are quite important to me. Gadgets as being very specific cultural artifacts um, that probably also always go extinct, like this one. This photo is called Into the Wild iPod. Um, what you see is the iPod before it became a uh, screen, a flat, and too stupid, or we became too stupid for it. So it still has this composition, it could be a solid bit, it could be you know, anywhere in, in a museum in the US. Um, it should be, so I, I kidnapped it and I make works with it. Case study houses, for example, this one is called the communal. So instead of the, the cocooning uh, introvert gadget, it becomes a communal space. Um, so inside you have this, this very um, it's a sacred space uh, with the two patio or cutouts in the ceiling. Um, gadgets of sleeves and skins and surface. So this whole idea of superficiality I to also uh, work with in a very material way. I had a like a Renaissance painting technique. Painter paint four marble panels for me. That if you connect them in a certain way, that all the you know all the lines run through. So you make let's say a real a real time rendering with them, um, but with four original patterns. Um, and once you put it in space and it becomes humid, it, the thing starts warping and it becomes very material. Um, yeah, that's the weak point. They're all pinned down with little push pins. Um, Cracks start showing whenever something happens. Um, one last thing that I fly over, um, I also like spam. Uh, not not uh, the ham, spam. Um, but spam as being the trash that everyone has but that nobody uses. Um, except for ITers who make money by walking spam, which doesn't really work. Um, but spam also has a very specific kind of email. And as that it's an object or a gadget. Uh, from something that is probably disappearing, which is email. Um, I think much. I should move on to texting, texting in the next phase. But so, I started using spam. I made furniture for an office, I would cheap chipboard, melamine. Um, I organized a team of uh, employees, uh, which are museum directors, collectors, friends, um, the audience. This is in Belgium, this is in the UK. And they interact, or they, they, they use the furniture as a kind of prop. You see, it doesn't really work too well. So we have a team, and what do we do in Spam Office, which is the work? We archive emails, we archive Spam emails. So we have a front desk uh, where, you know, where you can, you can exploit all spaces in the museum by putting somewhere a front desk, a back desk, um, a very reduced um, tool set that everyone uses. We have lunches in a, in a place that we installed for lunch room. And people interact through these, you know, these McDonald's type shelf where you put the burgers through, so the emails go through those. Um, we also use the basements of museums, for example, to put the hard copy archive in. And with that archive, me as the artist at the end, I make print works that reappear in the offices as some kind of motivational art. Um, they, uh, yeah, in frames or in display cases. <laughs> so, everyone who works in Spam Office is, of course, very interested in it. Um, maybe because they don't work in bureaucracy, maybe because they do, uh, maybe because they want to be close to that artwork, maybe because they're graphic designers, because also let them make these things now. Uh, the nice thing is that nobody really plays a role, but everybody is just employees. And, and this is very interesting to walk into um, as, you know, as, as a visitor. Um, the only uh, times that everyone is a performer is at the opening and the ending parties, which are staged as office parties and happy hours. Um, so everyone is somehow a prop or a performer. Yeah, that was quick. Um, back to the other business cards. Um, I don't think it's a split personality issue, rather a conscious <coughs> decision. Um, not to become a narrow-minded specialist. Um, it's a word in Dutch that's called fakidiot, something like profession and fool. Um, so professional fool. And when I tried to look it up this morning, um, it translated not really well to love your job. Um, you have to be careful with the love. Uh, but what I, what I, what I kind of liked was, um, 
No human translation has been found. No <laughs> I read this as a spam officer. I know that it's because there's no human contributions, but still, um, thinking of how hard it is for humans to escape this path of, of fuck idiots, um, I made a human translation for tonight's lecture on speedism that embodies maybe this tension that I try to explore between acting and being the professional and the personal, uh, the individual and your surrounding culture. We cut to Photoshop. Mickey Mies is maybe that combination of the two. Um, speedism is not just me, it's me and my partner, uh, Julian Sofriedauer. You see him on the left, um, a bit higher for him on the back. Um, we set up our practice in 2008 um, in something that we think is a theoretical visual practice. Um, and we work in something that we call the, the dead angle of architecture. The dead angle of architecture, that little isometric space, that cozy corner, has no boundaries. The dead angle, the black hole, the beast with the black mirror hat, lures you in and spits you out. There are no rules in the dead angle of architecture. Speedism, Julian and I, we roam theoretic landscapes in our visual universe. We're on a drug free rush into the non existing self. And on that way, we wrestle, we do our best to transcend the outer knees.
can help us to question the context of architecture in the city, our position within architecture and in that city. We compile a collector image just like a teenager compiles his or her own identity out of the surrounding availabilities. The approach is intuitive and fast. We are incomplete. While working on a project, we visually mix very diverse fields of influence ranging from Wikipedia to mythology, theory, geopolitics, technical restrictions of what we're working on, the news of the day, software, location, personal experiences, economics, globalism, nationalism, and so on. We don't go to the core of these things, but peel away some parts. We roam net referential networks as a legitimation to undercut the slow maturation of architectural thought. And as these visual worlds grow, the influences and layers start to manifest their sense. Combinations generate narrative, objects unfold meaning. These images are experiential, they are architectural sandbox or mental fitness centers. The weapon of choice is Photoshop. This choice is not arbitrary, but rather technical and tactical. Photoshop as an environment to theorize visually and experiment with speed in action works extremely well. While sketching and assembling ideas and bits of information, we stitch them together using tools. These tools function at this time like tropes, rhetorical actions. There are tools like liquefy, blur, sharpen, invert, mirror, rotate, crop, duplicate, saturate, merge. There's even a perspective tool to put constellations into perspective. As you distort an object, you distort its meaning, and you distort your mind. The isometric drawing style that we apply, which is easy in Photoshop using shortcuts and a little magic, enables us to connect and merge objects to create a world of hybrids. The resulting game-like aesthetic um, hints maybe at the performative process behind it and at the dynamic nature of the image being frozen in one specific constellation but waited to be activated again. Moreover, the ongoing search for a fitting visual style aims at the mediation between insiders and outsiders or to construct a conflict between both the professional and the individual within ourselves. The images that we make are our surface, our level of work and process, our means of communication, the gate to ideas and scenarios, and simultaneously the grounds where they grow. The images are not dead, they're dynamic, first of all, because the images are constructed through a ping-pong process between several players, we're editing, deleting, pimping, and reinterpreting layers in the Photoshop file all take place at the same time. The negotiation happens in pixels. Second, every time we present an image, we dive into it and break it open, and using Photoshop in live setups, we zoom, we pan, deform, duplicate, and we eventually direct. Narratives are generated on the spot. These interfaces must be obtrusive, noisy, endless, and low-tech. We should not just glide the surface, like smartphones and those new iPods, but we should crash land into them, break them open. Anti-interface, space interface. Both creation and presentation of an image are performative acts. So when we travel through the images, we get thrown back on the work, and the ideas that were so fast incorporated in this new world, the drawn objects become objections. We bury ourselves into cycles of production and reproduction. We do in order to think, and we think in doing, and rethink in redoing. The general conditions of today, in our nutshell, become the driving cultural, architectural, theoretical, and aesthetic conditions of the images. The images themselves attempt to art articulate these conditions. An example of how we use Photoshop in performances is this live setup that we've been uh, working with, with, which we call Photoshop Opera. Uh, this is a setup to present projects, but also generates a unique interface between the image, texts, and sound. In a room, well prepared, um, well prepared and layered Photoshop files are projected with two symmetrical mirror projectors. There's a third projector that produces super titles. We have smoke machines and a live soundtrack that we perform on stage. This, uh, this, this model that we work on um, with the Photoshop Opera is maybe something that could you know, be the opposite of a blog, where you just post the best images of the projects. Um, 
players and the audience connect through movement, space, image, sound, and time. This is a poster from a previous session we did like that in the US. Um, the performance was called Brooklyn Drone Temple Doom Baby. Um, we did this at the Metropolitan Exchange in New York. Um, another one is Untitled States of Doom and Symmetric Side Effects, uh, which we did at the MICA in Baltimore. These projects are a couple of years old. Um, yeah, we did it together, of course, because you cannot run an opera house with one person. Um, so it was the two of us. Um, sadly, Yulan is not here today, um, so we cannot do the full-fledged uh, opera style, but you know, nevertheless, follow me. Welcome to Peace Through Superior Horsepower and the Pig. We find ourselves in a city ruled over by a horse. The horse never leaves its range in the, in the backstage of a club club. Here's the horse. It's a metal horse, as you can see. So it's, you know, it's very strong. It's very macho. He rules the city in symmetrical Side effects are very apparent when you go over the ground and you look at the club. And you run the city, which is, apart from the urban focal point of the club club, not much more than highways, condominiums, and every now and then a parking garage. All the inhabitants of the city, called hypocrites, raise their steel horses through the city from from condo to condo, every now and then stop at the oil pool to bathe their horses. When we go back to the beginning, we see that the backstage of the horse, of the club club, is already underground. Underground, you find the Jade Mountain Range. This mountain range has nothing to do with the overground. It is chaotic, it is wild, it smells. It's fun. There is some activity done there, because every year the hypocrites choose the chosen one. The chosen one is a pig that they pick from the mountain range and finally lock in a stable. When we go back to the oil pool where the horse was bathing, and we go to the underground, we see that it's actually a sacrificial well. The horse has been drowned in the oil, and through the Greek column finds its way into the stable of the pig, where the pig eats and feeds off the horses. Here you see some leftover horse. Every year the chosen one, when fat enough, jumps out of the stable, rings the lantern bells, and makes its way down to the parade. jumps into his piggy nose and by that time above ground the city is just doing what it always does in the center of the city there is a big orgasmatronic demiurge the demiurge handles the status quo of the city of the horse he has two big lands, and out of one he spills nice detached houses. This happens here. And two grids that fill up the spaces between the highways. And in the other one, he's spinning the highways like a spider. Big vertical roundabouts are there for orientation help. You may also land in one of the very nice parking lot art areas. We can more look at the parking lot part. Every time when the bell is rung, each about once a year, the hypocrites take the ladders down to the underground and sit in their little VIP lodges.
Here's our pin again. The nose now mounted the two jade columns with the wobbly eyes and is on its way through the parade flanked by the twelve porcupine ancestors. They're the little old babies who make sure that the pig is fat enough to go down the parade. Some people never make it to the parade. Next to the Demiurg is an accelerator. It's the border of the city, it's a kind of gate to the city that speeds up all the horses. But if your speed is not fast enough, not high enough, you never make it through. That's the little apartheid that the horses figured out. These are all the horses that were not fast enough. Those who are fast enough come to witness the final stage of the pig. When the pig jumps out of the nose and walks under loud applause, Mexican waves, all the way down the ramp. Where a rocket specially made for the pig is waiting. The pig mounts the rocket, the rocket takes off. choose to take right into outer space. At that time, the pig crashed through club club number two, the symmetrical twin of the overground, and announces the beginning of a new symmetrical speed racing year. Cut all the way from Peaceful Superior Horse Town to Dungdo. Dungdo is a new Chinese city. The city exists just because of eight high rise architects who embodied themselves in the perfect towers. The first one is the Weepot Tower. Nice and clean, it's eight plus one floors, there's a mesh, a roof garden, and a little heavy drop. The next in line is Mama Papa Tower. After the perfect tower, mom and daddy, comes number three. Number three carries a newborn, it's a child's tower. Stands in an empty soy puddle, fancy detached houses underneath. And there, they, there they are, there he is, a little shrimp space frame being born out of the brick dumpling. landscape on the roof and a 
this team of mesh inside the cage. These parking garages seem familiar. After shopping, it's time for work. This is where the controller destroys the fundamentals of the building. There are CNYK builders and destroyers at work crystallizing new architecture on top of old architecture. The architects themselves neatly divided into the four colors, sit in their towers on top of the paper tower, and perform the great loop. party is not so nice. There seems to be a problem in our eight, in our seventh dragon. There is a problem. The seventh dragon is clad in jade, a little burial suit. A tear in his eye. up and it comes the eighth dragon to make our way through a much gooier landscape. This is the final disguise of our high-rise architect. This is the pig. Pig has a roof garden. Towers are somehow the lifeline of an architect, maybe of an architect in China, at least some architects. In China, though, if you look at Wikipedia, there's not eight but nine dragons. But the ninth dragon is always hidden. Even the emperor, who had all the nine dragons on his clothes, always had to cover up the ninth dragon. <coughs> in our reaction to a couple of other architects working in China, and we plead for fancy points to make the Chinese society happen in 60 years, we added an extra, the ninth hidden dragon. The ninth hidden dragon in our story is here. Apart from the perfect party upstairs, he's the doomed dragon. We propose a mental doom as a perfect balance to the factual dream that people are working on. Especially in China, where so much is happening in so little decades, the doom that is now reality, and that they're trying to get out of the reality, is something that we try at least mentally to maintain. The Ninth Dragon, therefore, carries the whole city on its back. more sustainable. and opens up to other individuals uh, to partake in the endeavor. 
Speed Space is um, a series of projects that I run at universities um, where I invite other people to uh, participate and generally um, continues on the themes in speedism um, but maybe a bit more dry. Um, speedism works in it, Speed Space explores the implementation of speed in design practice but also in methods and methodology. Seemingly high speed could not possibly be paired with the inertia of conventional design methods. Therefore, Speedspace investigates how a thorough design process can connect to the need for speedy realization and the culture it inspires, and where in our professional bubble the manifestation of speed generates new insight. It's a research project and starts off from these two observations. The fact that globally and exemplified most vividly in Eastern Asia, the prefiguration and the realization of new projects and cities takes place at a gigantic rate. The relation between the hyperreal, the render, as a visual translation of the imagined into the real, and the actual physical world becomes very tangled in time and space, and these two spheres of reality collide into a constantly visible micro future. Second, there exists quite a gap between our personal behavior and the way that we professionally behave. Our contemporary culture is more artificial and themed than the professional sphere of architectural education and practice will allow. On the other hand, media shape more and more the processes and the discourse in architecture, as well as the environment in which we work. A result is, for example, the dominant power of blog culture on referencing projects and input, benchmarks as an, as an effect Architecture evolves into an it architecture designed to thrive in the global sphere. Speed space is an experiential architectural theory where we give priority to image over words. We try to make a spatial mental construction that offers a multitude, multitude of perspectives and some tools that we all can try and test. Theory not as a truth, not written and published, but as a multidimensional stage performed in production and declamation that is looped and that gives rise to an unstop remix. Speed space forces everyone who participates to be in their time in order to work in their time. One of the main legs, main wings of the project is called Paradigm Weekly, um, which is collecting and working on best practices of this behavior, copied, um, represented, reused and discussed in studios. The fast and incomplete and superficial way of working and producing content for a mediatized world guarantees claims that are paradoxical, conflictuous, or just vague. Statements and paradigms and theories are no longer constructed, but their speedy alternatives are brought together in compilations. Speeding up decreases the time frame, and ideas loop as different players and platforms. Not the single line of thought matter, but a compiled panorama of objects and stories from which new scenarios might surface. Paradigm Weekly is most likely to become a continuous compilation and publication and exhibition connecting best practices of this behavior with design studio output. In these design studios and seminars I set up with colleagues and students, we focus on key items filtered from this process. These key items are, for example, Blog Off. Um, blog Off is the moniker under which um, we construct the notion of it architecture related to the phenomenon of the it girl um, and you know, broader basis explore block culture and how architecture behaves in this. Um, in seminars and design workshops, students present case studies and develop their own block probing productions that challenge the impact of contemporary visual culture on the behavior of architectural practice. Another course, another seminar is called Photoshop Holic. Uh, this course um, more or less continues where the Speedism Photoshop Opera um, is at. Um, in his incomplete manifesto for growth, Bruce Mao, a long time ago, told us to avoid software. The problem with software is that everyone has it. So in Photoshopaholics, uh, or in Photoshopaholic, um, I make for my students Photoshopaholics in a kind of boot camp experiment uh, where they experiment with Photoshop as a live creation tool through seminars and short drill exercises where students battle publicly from scratch around a given theme. The rest of the class votes, who stays, and the next in line takes the next one, takes the second computer. So the goal of this is of course that 
students or anyone um, let the borders um, evaporate between tutorials and what you know, between what you should do and what you can do, and the tools become very intuitive extensions to the mind and the senses. Reboots in Wonderland is maybe about designing your practice. Um, on the Brussels campus where I work, I, I set up three masters in architecture trajectories named REAL. REAL stands for Research, Exploration, Architecture and Laboratory. And the students come in for their full master's program and at the end they just have to develop their own practice. So they have four semesters to find their way in a sense. Um, we assist them in creating their own environment, their own setup, their own mental fitness center. Um, the focus is on performing in this environment uh, through scenarios and narrative and extensive exchange. Uh, the Swiss artist Thomas Hirschhorn uh, once said in an artist's statement that as an artist the problem is how to take position and how to give form to this position. Hirschhorn uses his art as a tool to confront with the world, as a tool to confront with the reality he's living in, and as a tool to confront with the time he's living in. In that respect, Confrontation is not only and not always glamorous, fashionable, or cool. His motto, therefore, is energy yes, quality no. I think in teaching architecture, we need a proper dose of this mentality as well. Another very important part, and that's really fun to do, is a speed trip, where let's say we try and revisit in, in, in realities in the world, we make reality checks of what speedism images might be in real time. Um, these field trips made in the East and West um, somehow yeah, seem most fitting in Asia um, because the way that work was reflective and action based, um, we tried to find speedism in the built realities, this, so to speak, built scenarios that we find in China. Um, during these speed trips, um, we set up or document existing situations that by means of high speed reverberate between fantasy and reality, between the constructed image and the environment. An example of such a speed trip that we once organized in Beijing um, took place when we hired a bus and we took 50 Chinese on a speedism trip into Beijing's hidden science fictions. We sped from cities in the city to cities under the city and outside of the city and found ways to parts of power and powerless parts in the city. The speeds and bus and its tour leader stopped at a castle, a replica of an old French chateau that was combined with a Russian looking colonnade. We also stopped at Book City, a giant black market corporate bookstore, a migrant dormitory, and I think the most uh, dazzling was the art factory, an industrial site that produces sculptures and paintings on demand in all sizes and materials. Um, this leads to the final thing that I want to show you, which is a film that we made with Speedism. Uh, the film is called, well, let's say backwards, Techno Shanghai. Um, a word game that refers to the rather doomed and anomalic celebration that we try to depict to the Chinese contemporary city. It is a Speedism, sh speedism take on the real Shanghai, understood as a surface on which with great speed, global objects and influences crash into its heart, and make up an urban, urban machine producing copies of copies that are inbreeding, incestuous, and mutating. The film was the result of a close collaboration with Crystal CG, which is China's leading media and visual communication company. They were, for example, responsible for Expo 2010 online and created visual communication apps for 2008 Beijing Olympics. The company also works for major architecture firms worldwide in providing renderings, animations, and interactive applications. So as Speedism, um, we were employed for our own project one summer, and as real method actor architects, we tried to infiltrate the world of city rendering with style. In the movie that you're about to see, maybe Shanghai has turned into a theme park that has really grown wild, and in an attempt to cope with the frustration that we experienced while working at Techno Shanghai, we stole some models, and with those models of the World Expo, we made this video that I will show you right now.
reaction. <laughs> Yeah. 
somehow relate to the objects that we are drawing, but they would not be something that's already in. That's how far we are right now. Yeah, I, I was going to It's 
to the fact that we are here instead of you know, um, so or what is watching lecture and growing up? Or is it become a kid? Or what is teaching when I'm teaching a studio? Everyone's really doing their best. And sometimes I want them to do their worst. That might really help them. Uh, so maybe that's nice. Um, for those who I see next week on the regimes, <laughs> we are worst. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 